Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I've got five new movies to review for you for this show. First, though, before I get into my movie reviews, I'm going to get into my segment, which I begin the hour every week with, which is what's topping the box office. This is a review of the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. Not all the top 10 grossing films are necessarily the box office winners, but I'll tell you which ones are winners and which ones are losers, or not yet winners, right now. So, number one at the box office, this should come as no surprise to anyone, is War for the Planet of the Apes. It's a little surprising that it knocked Spider-Man Homecoming from the number one slot, but altogether, if you have been anticipating War for the Planet of the Apes, you're probably not surprised. This weekend in America, or rather, yeah, in, in a, here at home, it grossed $56.3 million. Against a budget of $150 million, it has so far grossed $100.5 million around the world. So it's not a hit yet here in the States or around the world, but chances are in about a week or two, it will be at least a tentative hit. Spider-Man Homecoming was off to a really great start last week at number one. This week it dropped to number two, but I don't think it's going to be going anywhere anytime soon. I could be wrong about that, but Spider-Man Homecoming has so far grossed $44.2 million here in the States this weekend. Against a budget of $175 million, Spider-Man Homecoming has so far grossed $207.3 million here in the States and $467.3 million around the world, which makes it a tentative hit here in the States, which I imagine will be a certified hit in at least two weeks. And around the world is already, in just two weeks, a certified hit, so good for Spider-Man Homecoming. Despicable Me 3 is also pulling in some pretty impressive numbers, despite the fact that it's actually not one of the films I have reviewed for this show so far. But that doesn't mean other people aren't enjoying it. <laughs> Much to my chagrin. This weekend, Despicable Me 3 grossed $19.4 million in the United States. Against a budget of $80 million, Despicable Me 3 has so far grossed $188.4 million here in the States and $622.4 million around the world, which makes it a certified hit here in the States and globally. Baby Driver is also doing really well in its third week in release, having grossed $8.7 million this weekend. Against a budget of $34 million, Baby, Driver's, Baby Driver has so far grossed $73.1 million here in the States and $96.3 million around the world, which, like Despicable Me 3, makes Baby Driver a certified hit here in the States and around the world. So very good for Baby Driver. It's certainly being elevated by way of word of mouth. The Big Sick, which opened nationwide this past weekend, had the biggest climb from number eight last week to number five this week, having grossed 7.5 million this weekend, which is a record for that movie. My anticipation is that The Big Sick will actually gross more next weekend, but that we'll have to see. Against the, actually, I don't have the budget for The Big Sick. I do know how much it grossed domestically, and that's it. It grossed $16 million. But because I don't have the budget for you, I can't tell you whether it's a, a flop, a tentative hit, or a certified hit. My guess is it's probably not a flop. It's probably doing well, but I don't have the budget for you. Wonder Woman is number six at the box office this weekend, sliding from number four last week. This weekend, Wonder Woman grossed $6.8 million. Against a budget of $149 million, though, Wonder Woman has so far grossed $380.6 million here in the States and $765.9 million around the world, which makes it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. It's doing very well in just seven weeks of release. Wish Upon is the number two highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it debuts at number seven, which might mean it might not look good for Wish Upon. However, this weekend, it grossed $5.5 million here in the States, and that's against a budget of $12 million. So it's not a hit yet, but it's off to a surprisingly good start, especially given its debut position in the top 10. We'll have to see whether or not it recoups all its money back, but my guess is with a modest budget of $12 million, it probably will. 
A movie that's really struggling to make all its money back is Cars 3. Again, it's not doing terribly, but it hasn't recouped all its money back here in the States, and it looks like it may not do that, at least not with domestic box office grosses. This weekend, Cars 3 grossed $3.1 million. Against a budget of $175 million, Cars 3 has so far grossed $140 million here in the States and $223 million around the world. So it's not a hit yet here in the States. Around the world, it is a tentative hit. But it is telling that Cars 3 has grossed half as much around the world in five weeks of release as Despicable Me 3 has in three weeks. I don't know why that is. I can guarantee you Cars 3 is a better movie than Despicable Me 3. Both of them are beloved franchises that have a mass appeal to children, but why Cars 3 isn't catching up to Despicable Me 3, I don't know, but it's not looking good for Disney Pixar. Fortunately, they do have another chance later this year with another film they're going to release called Coco. So, But that's going to be... I think around Thanksgiving that that film comes out, but I will let you know what I think of that movie months from now. But Transformers The Last Night is a movie that's also sliding in the box office. Last weekend it was number five in the box office. This weekend it's number nine. And my guess is you're probably not going to see this movie in the top ten next week. This weekend it grossed $2.8 million against a budget of $217 million. Transformers The Last Night has so far grossed $125 million here in the States and $517.4 million around the world. So yes, it is a certified hit around the world, but here in the States, it's not even close to a hit, which brings into question whether or not a fifth or a sixth Transformers movie is in the works. My guess is probably not. And finally, a movie that's probably destined to be a flop by now is Will Ferrell and Amy Poehler's The House, which is number 10 at the box office this weekend, sliding, a f sliding from its debut at number 7 last week. It grossed $1.7 million this weekend against a budget of $40 million. It so far grossed $23.1 million here in the States and $29.8 million around the world, which means it's not a hit yet here in the States or around the world. Just another review before I move on to my first just another note before I move on to my first review that the views and opinions expressed in this show are solely those of my own and they do not necessarily reflect those of anyone working for the Somerville Media Center or the Somerville Media Center as a whole. With that said, the first movie I'm going to be reviewing is War for the Planet of the Apes, which is the third movie in the Planet of the Apes prequels which have proven themselves to be probably better than the original Planet of the Apes films. It's still debatable as to whether or not any of the Planet of the Apes films are better than the original one from 1968, but they are certainly better than a lot of the sequels that came out in the early 70s, by far. So War for the Planet of the Apes is about, well, a war between the apes and the humans. This time, after the apes suffer an unimaginable losses, Caesar, the leader of the apes, wrestles with his darker instincts and, begin his own, and begins his own mythic quest to avenge his kind. In this movie, Andy Serkis reprises his motion capture role as Caesar, the leader of the apes, and he is after a human by the name of the Colonel, who's played by Woody Harrelson, who is not only the leader of a militant group by the name of Alpha Omega, but the Colonel also personally killed Caesar's wife, his younger brother, and one of his sons. So Caesar is blind with, with rage in a way that reminds a lot of people, or rather a lot of apes in this movie, of Caesar's nemesis, Koba, from who was killed in the previous film, but Koba actually makes a few appearances in this movie, um, not just in flashbacks, but also in dream sequences. So just to let you know where the Planet of the Apes saga left off after the last movie, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, Caesar and the apes formed a truce with the aliens with whom they were previously at war thanks to the misinformation spread by Caesar's at first adversary and then enemy, Koba. 
or rather, yeah, sorry, Luca. Luca is the the enemy ape. So, at, in the end, a little bit of a spoiler alert here. Caesar kills Luca, saying, "No, no ape shall kill another ape." But in Caesar's words to Luca, "You are no ape." Well, unfortunately, Luca's betrayal of Caesar and the rest of the apes causes, in the long run, a full-out global-scale war between the very mentally adapted apes and the few humans that are left that haven't suffered from the virus that has spread around the world. So, it looks like, if you, if you know your, your history of the Planet of the Apes, the apes are probably going to win this one, but it's not without a lot of struggle. And what I loved about the War for the Planet of the Apes is the side of the humans has pretty much already been told here. So now it's time for the apes not only to take over the world, but also take over the narrative and become increasingly more sympathetic characters and creatures. And Andy Serkis does a great job here playing Caesar, who, because of his advanced brain power, is able to speak more in this movie than use sign language. It's still not entirely explained why the other apes aren't able to speak as much as Caesar yet in this film, but they still communicate via sign language, and Caesar is able to understand them, and they are actually under able to understand Caesar's speaking in return. So there's a lot going on in this movie. The primary plot of it is that Caesar is trying to seek revenge from the colonel, who is played here by Woody Harrelson. And there are also some other apes that make an appearance, including one former zoo ape who refers to himself as Bad Ape, and he's played, he's, he's both voiced by and motion captured by the actor Steve Zahn. And Bad Ape is the, the comic relief of the movie, which is otherwise a very serious and very dark film. But I do have to argue that War for the Planet of the Apes is, among the three prequels that have come out so far, I think it's the best movie of the three. And that's not to take away from Rise of the Planet of the Apes or Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Both of those movies were really good, and, and especially Rise of the Planet of the Apes exceeded so many people's expectations. But this is one of the only movie trilogies where each subsequent chapter gets better and better. And it has a lot to do with the acting, but it also has a lot to do with the, uh, the, the special effects as well. But mostly, the, the narrative of this film is really strong, and the cinematography is also one of the film's main strengths. A lot of critics so far have compared this movie to a number of westerns, like The Searchers and The Wild Ones, and those are all very valid comparisons, to which I would agree. I was also reminded a lot of several dark war movies, particularly those that take place in Vietnam, like Platoon and Apocalypse Now. And I think that there are a lot of allegories you can draw with the, the apes in this film. In fact, in the Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, I thought the apes in that film drew a distinct comparison to Native Americans. But in this film, you can draw comparisons between them and maybe Japanese Americans during World War II, or, well, I, I won't get into too many other ethnic oppressed groups to which you could draw allegories between them and the apes in this film, but overall, it's a really great movie, tells a great story. I give it my rating of an absolute knockout. It's one of my favorite movies of the summer and also of the year so far. It's one of the few summer movies that's been advertised as much as it has that has lived up to a vast majority of its hype. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Wish Upon. This is the latest from director John R. Leonetti, who has brought us such horror movies before as The Conjuring. And he also, uh, let's see, well, he's been a cinematographer for The Conjuring and also a couple of other horror films, including 
Insidious Chapter 2. Uh, I don't... Actually, he did not direct The Conjuring. He did actually direct Annabelle from a couple of years ago, which I didn't think was a great horror film. In fact, I think I listed upon uh, amongst the worst films of the year in my retrospective in 2014. If you didn't tune into that, that's okay. It was years ago. But there's actually a sequel to Annabelle that's coming out in a couple of months, which shows that not everybody hated Annabelle as much as I did. But Wish Upon, this movie right here, which also stars Joey King, who is in the movie, well, who is in the movie The Conjuring, to which John R. Leonetti did cinematography work. The movie Wish Upon is about a teenage girl who discovers a box that carries magical powers and a deadly price for using them. So this is a movie where a teenage girl discovers a box that comes from ancient China and has cryptic language that can't easily be deciphered these days. And this box is able to grant whoever possesses it seven wishes. But as these kind of stories go, you can't take something for nothing. And when you wish for something, something else in your life gets taken away. It's like the good box giveth and the good box taketh away. This story has been told so many times before, probably most notably in a 1902 story, which was a horror supernatural short story called The Monkey's Paw. And I won't give away exactly what happens in The Monkey's Paw, but it's, it's basically the same thing. The Monkey's Paw is one of these props that grants whoever is in possession of it a certain number of wishes, and with these wishes come consequences. I think there's probably been episodes of The Twilight Zone that have had the exact same theme. So, Wish Upon is nothing new in terms of story, and in terms of it being scary, it's not, particularly. And in fact, they could have actually used a monster or some sort of supernatural deity in this film, but they didn't. The deaths that happened from this teenage girl who's, whose character's name is Claire Shannon, and she's played by Joey King, what happens to the people in her life when she uses this is just not particularly scary. In fact, I think just about all the deaths that happen in this film were probably or look like they've been taken from Final Destination. In addition to that, there's almost this John Hughes kind of cliche. In fact, I it's it's wrong to drag John Hughes into this because John Hughes didn't delve into teen movie cliches, but this is a horror movie that's trying to be a John Hughes movie at the same time. This character, Claire Shannon, is a girl in high school. Again, she's played by Joey King. And she's unpopular. She's picked on by one of the popular girls in her group. And she has two... Uh, she has two friends with whom she relies upon for moral support. They're good friends, but they're also one of them in particular, um, who's played by Sydney Park, you wouldn't believe as being unpopular. As a matter of fact, the, the actress Joey King, while she's not strikingly beautiful in the same way that, say, Megan Fox or m many of the other popular girls in this movie are, she's not... <sighs> I don't think she's believably unpopular in this film. I, I think if she went to any high school posing as a student, she, she might become popular just based on her looks alone. In other words, she is... She, she's more than fair. She's pretty. So, the movie makes you think she's this tormented teen, but it's just not particularly working very well. She also has a, a father named Jonathan, who's played by Ryan Phillippe, who's a who's a dumpster diver. He's constantly looking in dumpsters to find rare treasures, and that's actually where he finds this, this box with the cryptic Chinese language on it. And the, the way that this character, Claire, discovers that you can make wishes using this box is completely contrived. No one tells her that she can make wishes on it. She can't read the cryptic Chinese characters 
on the outside of it. So she basically just picks the box up and starts wishing, which doesn't seem to be a, a great way to, to start off this movie. Plus, the deaths that happen in this movie, they try to fool with you and, and try to think, try to throw a twist at you, but none of these twists register. They're, all the deaths are uh, flinch-worthy, I'll say that, but overall you can tell who's going to die, when they're going to die, and it's just overall a pretty predictable movie. So there's really nothing special about Wish Upon. I'm reluctant to give it a flunk out, which is my lowest rating for movies, because... It wasn't that bad. I didn't think the acting was particularly bad. I think the problem mainly was with the narrative and also the almost cutting corners with the special effects. I, I just, I've seen so many things that have happened in this movie before, but overall, I think Joey King is a competent actress. Ryan Phillippe was somewhat miscast as his, as her uh, potentially embarrassing dad. I just, I, I just wasn't buying it for a second. Also, th there were moments where you, you'd think the protagonist would do something with the box when she finds out how to get rid of the, the curses that are happening when she makes wishes. What she has to do is something very, very simple, and it's something that somebody who can read this cryptic Chinese language, ancient Chinese language, tells her she can do. But instead, she just does the opposite in trying to get rid of the box. So, Wish Upon gets my rating of a very low strikeout. Again, not a terrible movie, but it's not scary, it's not surprising in any way, and it's just basically worth skipping if you're tempted to see it at all. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is A Ghost Story. A Ghost Story is a movie that, from the poster, where you see a guy dressed in a sheet, and also the faded black and gray colors that go with the poster, you would assume, and also the fact that it's called A Ghost Story, that it would be a horror movie. Well, it is supernatural, naturally, because there's a ghost, but it's not quite the movie you would expect. It's certainly not the movie I would expect. Here's what the movie's about. It's about a recently deceased white-sheeted ghost returning to his suburban home to try to connect, or excuse me, to reconnect with his bereft wife. So the person who is the ghost is a character who's just, whose name is, in this movie, C. What that C stands for, I don't know. But he's played by Casey Affleck. And his wife, who's known as M, again, no name, just a letter, is played by Rooney Mara. So you don't see much of Casey Affleck, particularly in the beginning, but you see enough to know exactly what kind of relationship he has with his wife, Rooney Mara's character. And then he gets involved in a car accident. And it's one of these films that narratively reminds me a lot of Terrence Malick's later films, in that there's a setup, and then there's a consequence, but when you, what's missing in between is the action. But I think that actually worked very well with this movie, A Ghost Story, than it did with Terrence Malick's last film, which also coinc coincidentally starred Rooney Mara. And it's, I, I think the name of that movie was Don't Forget the, or rather, Don't Stop the Music, or it had something to do with music, but I'm, I'm sorry for forgetting the title of that. But this is a movie I didn't expect would be thought-provoking or even really that dramatic, but I loved this take on a ghost story. The fact that it could be weird, yes, but it didn't necessarily have to be terrifying. And I, I liked that. It certainly had a bit of, actually quite a bit of dramatic gravitas to it, as well as it had a bit of a romantic flair to it. And there are shots that writer and director David Lowry made in this film that go on for a very long time. But in my opinion, having seen this film, admittedly when I wasn't tired, the long shots were not boring. They, they might be to some viewers. I think 
this is one of those movies, I think you would get the biggest benefit from it from seeing it in a theater as opposed to seeing it on your iPad or on your TV because there's always the temptation when you're watching it in any other place beside a movie theater to just either pause it at various times or fast forward through some of the so-called boring parts. But the movie is long and it has very long shots where it seems like nothing's happening, but it's not boring. And the difference between a movie that's elaborate and boring and one that's elaborate and not boring is when a movie's elaborate and not boring, you want to see what happens next. So there's a, a scene in particular that I thought was very striking where Rooney Mara's character is standing over the dead body of Casey Affleck as it's her duty to identify the body after, after the, the, the car crash in which Casey Affleck's character, it kills him. So th there's a long shot where Rooney Mara leaves the room and you just see the morgue. There's just a still shot where literally nothing is happening and no one is moving. I couldn't exactly tell you how long it goes on for, but it feels like a really long time. But when, when Casey Affleck actually sits up from his lying down position, that's really striking. And it's one of those moments you know is going to happen and you're waiting very anxiously for it to happen but you don't know exactly when it's gonna happen, so it increases the anticipation. And David Lowry, the writer and director of this film, actually said in an interview that he doesn't blame people who walk out of this movie. Well, I think he's being modest, because yeah, as I said, there are those drawn out scenes where it seems like he could cut to something else anytime he wishes, and in that respect, a Ghost Story is one of those movies that I think, in terms of its cinematography, if Stanley Kubrick were alive today, I think he would probably be very drawn to the story and probably make the same kind of decisions with the camera. In other words, it's reminiscent to 2001 A Space Odyssey in that the, the, cam the still camera focuses on a scene and lets it play out when there's no action going on. But it's almost like looking at a piece of art, such as a painting. You're, it, it allows you to take the atmosphere in. And also, if you're not paying attention to the central focus of the scene, you're probably looking at other aspects of the scenery. And that, in turn, draws you into the film. And I found myself a little bit fidgety during some parts of the movie, but overall, I stayed in my seat. I was tempted to leave, but at the same time, I also wanted to see what happens next. And I loved that original aspect of a ghost story. And I also liked the fact that you see the ghost in its sheet, but as it's walking around, you get a sense of the rules by which this ghost has to follow. And those rules are never told to you, not verbally or in writing. And in writing would be kind of weird, but eventually you learn what the rules are for this ghost, and you begin to find out how to play along with these rules. I really respected that aspect of a ghost story that didn't have to be the scary, scary horror film. And it, it gets my reading of a knockout. I think it may not be one of the best films of the year. I'm still not sure about that, but it's certainly original. It's certainly intriguing. It's it's not necessarily always dark, but I found myself intrigued by all of the characters despite their limited dialogue. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Book of Henry, which is a drama which also has some elements of a uh, crime thriller in it. And it's the crime thriller part where this movie kind of falls apart, but the movie is about a woman who's a waitress who's played by Naomi Watts, who has two sons, one of whom is literally a genius. And with instruction from her genius son's carefully crafted notebook, 
This single mother sets out to rescue a young girl from the hands of her abusive stepfather. So this is a movie that has some precarious plot themes in it, but I've always liked movies about child geniuses. In fact, there was one movie that came out earlier this year that starred Chris Evans and Jenny Slate about a, a genius child. And that movie, I wish I had looked it up actually during my break, but I can't quite remember the name of it. But if you'll excuse me, I'll look it up. But while I'm looking it up, I'll just tell you that the director of the movie The Book of Henry was Colin Trevorrow, who actually wrote and directed Jurassic World from last year. And he is not only he not only wrote the sequel to that, which is coming out in 2018, but he's also slated to direct Star Wars Episode Nine, which at press time is scheduled to come out in 2019. Whether or not it actually will, we'll have to see. By the way, that um, that Genius Kid movie starring Chris Evans and Jenny Slate was a movie called Gifted. Gifted was a very good film. The Book of Henry, despite having a really good director and a really good cast behind it is a movie that falters. And I think it falters specifically when the movie gets to be about this genius son's suspicions that the girl who lives next door to him was around at the same age as him is being abused by her stepfather. And the, the kid wants to make you believe, the audience, that he has concrete proof that she's being abused. But he doesn't really. His reasoning is based on circumstantial evidence. But a little bit more on that later. How is the kid in the film himself? Well, the genius kid in this film is named Henry Carpenter, and he's played by Jaden Lieberher. And I thought Jaden Lieberher was a good actor. The problem was with his dialogue. The movie was... Of course, as I said, directed by Colin Trevorrow, but it's written by Greg Hurwitz. And I thought that the problem with Greg Hurwitz's script was that he made the kid be a little too wise beyond his years. Because I think that child geniuses have book smarts, but not street smarts. And here, the movie makes you think that this kid has both. And instead of being a realistic depiction of a child genius, it felt more like a child who is given words that an adult wrote. Now, obviously, I don't think there's been a single child who's written a big budget movie or a movie that's been released by a major studio or even an independent studio. I might be wrong, but, but the point is, the kid genius in this film sounds too much like an adult, and I think that's very distracting. Now, the movie Gifted, which I mentioned earlier, which stars Chris Evans, Jenny Slate, and several other actors, I thought told a more realistic version of the child genius movie. In that movie, you had a child genius who was very skilled, particularly at math, but she wasn't in terms of her philosophy of life, wise beyond her years. In other words, she didn't seem to have the street smarts of a 40-year-old. You would believe that she was an actual kid, you know? And in this movie, you don't get that sense of belief. And then, not a spoiler, by the way, the genius kid in this movie dies. Apparently, he was epileptic, but the movie doesn't get into that until about halfway through. So when he dies, he leaves behind a notebook for his mother, who is not a genius. Her name is Susan. She's played by Naomi Watts, and she's a waitress in a small town. And this carefully crafted notebook details how to kill this girl next door's stepfather. And the stepfather is a police chief by the name of Glenn Sickleman, who's played by Dean Norris, best known for playing Uncle Hank in Breaking Bad, uh, a part in which he was really good. In fact, Dean Norris is a competent actor, and in this movie, he does what he can with the part he's given, but the problem is, he's not given a lot. He's just made to look evil. And I think he looks too evil to the fact, 
to the point where it's a wonder why other people besides this child genius Henry, a- after whom the the movie is named, doesn't get that there's a shady side to him because I got that suspicion immediately. Not because Dean Norris is a big guy, but because he's always shown in shades of gray and black, and he's almost made to look more evil than I think he probably should have. But again, getting back to my problems with the child abuse part of this movie, the kid Henry doesn't see the girl be abused. Based on what you see, which is from the eyes of Henry, it's it's a case of at best, circumstantial evidence. And when Henry actually argues with his principal about reporting this girl's stepfather to the police, she makes some very compelling arguments as to why that's not the case. And if you don't have direct evidence, you think you would get direct evidence. You know, have a camera set up in your window and maybe a, a video or a still camera and actually show the abuse taking place. Also, you don't see it, any signs of abuse on the girl. You don't see a black eye. And maybe it's not that apparent, but you're just told what the signs of abuse are, that she's been missing school for a couple of days or something like that. And there's some sort of abuse, like she ran into a doorknob. Uh, excuses we've always we've heard before in other media, but because of all this, it gets my rating of a strikeout. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Girls Trip. This is a movie that hasn't come out yet, but will come out this Friday, July 21st, 2017. And it's about four lifelong friends, all four African American women who traveled to New, or- to New Orleans, Louisiana, for the annual Essence Festival. And sisterhoods are rekindled, wild sides are rediscovered, and there's enough dancing, drinking, brawling, and romancing to make the Big Easy blush. Well, that's the description. Making the Big Easy blush, no, nah, I, I think it'd take a lot more than uh, a girl's weekend to do that. But then again, there is a lot of raunchy comedy here, but unlike... The similarly themed Rough Night from a couple of weeks ago, the movie starring Scarlett Johansson, Jillian Bell, and Kate McKinnon, amongst others. Girls Trip is actually funny. And it also doesn't delve into too dark territory. And in terms of movies with a predominantly African-American cast, there is one theme that seems to be recurring in this film that's that occurs in other African-American comedies and dramas of the of, of similar themes. So I'll get into that a little bit later, but the four women in this movie are one woman named Ryan Pierce, who is a motivational speaker and author, who's played by Regina Hall. You have Sasha Franklin, her best friend, who used to be a journalist, but is now an independent gossip blogger, who's played by Queen Latifah. You have Lisa Cooper, who is a single mother of two, who works as a nurse, who's played by Jada Pinkett Smith. And then you have Dina, who is a recently unemployed woman who's played by Tiffany Haddish. Of the four women in this movie, Tiffany Haddish is probably the least well-known. And Tiffany Haddish has been in a number of other films recently. Probably most notably, she plays um, Jordan Peele's love interest in Keanu, But she's also a regular on the recently canceled The Carmichael Show. And she's been in a number of other movies and TV shows in supporting roles. But chances are, after this film, you will definitely know who she is. Because even though the other three women in this movie are funny, I think Tiffany Haddish is actually the funniest. Probably because of the four women, she has the least to lose. Not only does she have screamingly funny lines in this film, but there's also a certain gag she does with a banana and a a grapefruit half. I'm not going to tell you what that is, not only because it will spoil the the, the shock and awe of of the gag, but also because it is really dirty. That's all I'm going to say about that. So anyway, these four women are in... 
New Orleans for the Essence Festival, particularly because Ryan Pierce and her husband, Stuart Pierce, who's played by Mike Coulter, are a motivational speaker and author team who are there to get actually a big book deal thanks to their agent, Elizabeth Davelli, who's played in this movie by Kate Walsh. And Kate Walsh is an actress whose name might not be readily familiar or apparent, readily apparent, but she's actually, she actually played Dr. Addison Montgomery on the first several seasons of Grey's Anatomy. And she was also, she also played the same role in another ABC drama called Private Practice. So she's someone whose face you definitely know from seeing it. And she also has a number of funny scenes and funny lines in this movie as well, especially when she's, as a white woman, is trying to get her message across, probably a little insultingly, to her African-American clients. And I, I think the interaction between her and Regina Hall does have some rich moments. The part where this movie delves into African-American movie cliches is when Ryan Pierce's husband, she finds out, is cheating on her. And once you see this actor, Mike Coulter, both with Regina Hall and also in a suit, it delves into probably one of the newest African-American movie cliches, that if an African-American man is doing well in a seemingly happy marriage and is wearing a suit, he can't keep it in his pants. And this is a troubling theme amongst African-American movies, both comedies and dramas. I don't know why it keeps recurring. I doubt this is a prevalent problem in the African-American community as a whole, but it certainly is on the big screen. And I, I just don't know why they included that in this movie. And that's probably one of the things that dragged this movie down the most. We've seen this kind of dynamic before where there's a respectable African-American woman whose husband is cheating on her. And not only is he trying to justify the cheating, but the hoochie mama in question, who in this movie is played by Deborah Ayurinde, is also trying to rub that in her face. It seems like, and th there is that saying, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, I could probably imagine hell has nothing on an African-American woman scorned. So I don't know why that's, why that happens in so many African-American movies. I wish that had been left out of this movie in general. And in fact, I don't think this is a movie that necessarily what needed any sort of conflict, certainly not romantic conflict. But I did like this movie a lot. I think all four women in this film played off the, each other very well. Even Jada Pinkett Smith, who I never really found to be particularly funny. I think she's a good actress, but I never found her to be especially funny. She is kind of the wind, she's wound up so tight in some scenes that you could almost put a string around her and use her as a top. But once she relaxes a little bit, once these four women have their fun, I think it is a movie worth watching. It's a movie to which I give my rating of a checkout because it's much funnier than the movie Rough Night from a few months ago. And it's more original than that other part I mentioned. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. Thank you for joining me. And the next segment I'm going to be doing is what's coming out next. These, this is a verbal look at the movies that are coming out this coming weekend. I already told you about the movie Girls Trip, which is a movie I think will actually be a pretty big hit. I don't think it will outseat War for the Planet of the Apes, not by a long shot, but I wouldn't be surprised to see this movie be number three or number four at the box office. And I, as I said in my review, it's a checkout because of some of its cliches, but I did find this movie to be very funny. And again, just a review, it stars Regina Hall, Queen Latifah, Jada Pinkett Smith, and Tiffany Haddish, the latter of whom is not a newcomer, but this is indeed her breakout role. And I think that if you do see this movie, you will find it funny, certainly funnier than Rough Night. And 
I think the only thing that might hurt Girl Strip is it might be negatively compared to Rough Night, just based on its poster, but not because of its content. I, I do marginally recommend it. But other movies that are coming out this coming weekend include a big one from Christopher Nolan, and that movie is called Dunkirk. This is a movie about Allied soldiers from Belgium, the British Empire, and France who are surrounded by the German army and evacuated during a fierce battle in World War II. I do not know if this is actually based on a true story. I do know that Christopher Nolan directed the movie. Uh, he also wrote the film. But I can't tell you whether or not this is fiction or based on a true story. But it stars a number of newcomers and some people, some actors who have been in other Christopher Nolan films in the past, in the recent past, make appearances in this movie, including Cillian Murphy and Tom Hardy. But they are not the, the primary stars of this film. But Dunkirk is a movie I guarantee you I will see this weekend, and I'll let you know what I think on next week's show. Another movie that looks curious to me, I'm not sure if it necessarily looks good, is a movie called Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. This is directed by Luc Besson, who is a French director who has brought us such films in the past as The Fifth Element and Léon the Professional. And he's also written screenplays for Taken 2 and Transporter 2. So this is a guy who's made certainly some cult classic science fiction films, and that's certainly the case with The Fifth Element, which, if you could believe it, came out 20 years ago. But Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets has an interesting cast. It stars Dane DeHaan, Cara Delevingne, Clive Owen, and Rihanna. And it's a movie about a dark force that threatens Alpha, a vast metropolis and home species from a thousand planets. Special operatives Valerian and Laureline must race to identify the marauding menace and safeguard not just Alpha, but the future of the universe. This movie, I think, might do well. I don't think it's going to outseat War for the Planet of the Apes for the number one spot. I could be wrong. I think one of the things that might hurt this movie is, judging from the poster, I, I think moviegoers might inevitably compare this movie to Star Wars. But I'm going to see this, I'm going to put all preconceived notions aside, and I'll let you know what I think about this movie when I see it. So that's two movies I'm definitely going to see. There's another movie that's coming out, it, it says in wide release, and it's called Land, Landline. And this is a movie that stars Jenny Slate in what could be her breakout role after Obvious Child. But this is a movie that takes place in 1995, so there are no affordable cell phones. Notice I said affordable. There were cell phones back then, but no affordable ones. Anyone who wanted to be really connected carried around a beeper. And the internet wasn't as efficient or as widespread as it is today. But anyway... This is a movie about a teenager living with her sister and her parents in Manhattan who, <clears throat> excuse me, who discovers that her father is having an affair. So the father in this movie is played by John Turturro. And this is a movie that with a lot of early buzz. It reteams obvious child star Jenny Slate with the director of that movie, Gillian Robespierre. And it looks like certainly a quirky comedy. Oh, and also Edie Falco is in it as Jenny Slate's mother and also John Turturro's wife. I've liked Jenny Slate in just about every movie I've seen her in. And I even mentioned a movie I saw her in earlier this year called Gifted, which co-starred Chris Evans, which was a very good film. So I'll see Landline if it's, a, if it's out in theaters near me, and I'll let you know what I think next week. Another movie that's coming out is one from abroad, which it doesn't say whether this movie is in limited release, but it's coming out somewhere regardless. And it's called The Midwife. This is a movie that stars Catherine Deneuve, Catherine Fraught, Olivier Gourmet, and Quentin Domayer. And it's a movie about a midwife who gets unexpected news from her father's old mistress. That's all the movie, that's all the tagline says. And that's all I'll leave you with.